I'm going to talk to you about the war for the free world. Uh, my thought here is what I might usefully do in some very quickly loaded slides is to synthesize what you've already heard, anticipate a little bit about what you're going to hear from my colleagues on the national security team, and of course from the extraordinary John Bolton shortly. Uh, and in particular, try to give you some ideas as to how you talk about this, how you not only think about it, but how you can communicate what we're all about to others. So Ronald Reagan talked about every generation facing an existential threat to freedom. I'm sure you're familiar with this quote. Um, in our time, we've been told what we're dealing with alternatively is terrorism or now violent extremism. So who are those people, those masked men as you were? Uh, of course, we're hearing a lot of the moment about the Islamic State. Um, you're hearing about some lone wolves like those who did the San Bernardino attack and the Orlando attack. But of course, there are other violent extremists, um, starting with the ones that we used to worry about, Al-Qaeda and a lot of their offspring and partners in crime. What all of them have in common, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard a characteristically brilliant exposition about it from Andy and so many others talking about it, is Sharia. Sharia. What is it? It is the traditional and authoritative rendering of Islam. Make no mistake about it. I don't know whether this is exactly right, but by some estimates, 10% of it actually has something to do with the pietistic practice of the faith. What does the rest of it have to do with? Well, did we lose one? We did lose one, somewhere in there. The rest of it, well, let me make this point. There are Muslims, this one happens to be a good friend of mine, who don't believe that their practice of Islam is governed by Sharia. We call those good Muslims. They're called by everybody else bad Muslims or apostates, and they can get themselves killed for talking about it. Um, these are some of the signs of Sharia that you're familiar with, uh, literally in the streets of London these days. What is it? It is a primarily totalitarian ideology. Yes, it has a patina, a veneer, a mask, if you will, of religiosity, but it is all about power, really. Political, military, legal power. Whoop, there we go. Um, well, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, I told you about my IT karma. Okay, well, Vic, if you can, oh, there we go. There we go. Did you just pull the plug? <laughs> I tell you, it happens every time. So. It is, if we get this right, possible to do something about this, namely by understanding it to be a seditious ideology. If on the other hand, we persist in what we've been doing to date and treating it as a religion, we're doomed. Because far from protecting ourselves and our constitutional republic against it, we're supposed to protect it against us, right? So, um, what is the other principal characteristic of Sharia, and by the way, of all of those groups that I mentioned to you? It's jihad, a term you're all very familiar with. I'm just going to show you some of its manifestations. Uh, the violent kind, of course, we're all terribly familiar with, particularly since 9-11. Uh, the kind that is per perpetrated not by groups, but by so-called lone wolves, our colleague Patrick Poole calls them known wolves because in almost every case the authorities did know something about them, but it's actually just individual jihad. It's not people whacked and going off on their own. Next slide, come back to me, there we go. Then there's refugee jihad. You've been hearing a lot about it, including from my colleague Jim Simpson. The Hydra, term you ought to use, get to know, it's about colonization or invasion. We're seeing a lot of it in Europe, and it is headed here. I'm not actually sure this is a Sharia-compliant mule, but you get the idea. When you see Hezbollah and Hamas, and for that matter, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and others engaged in major international drug trafficking, think about that as a kind of jihad, too a taking down of our society that makes everything else that they're up to easier to do. And by the way, 
One of the really insidious pieces of all of this is when you hear Barack Obama and Paul Ryan talking about letting more felons out of jail because they're nonviolent drug offenders. Ooh. Know this, quite a number of them are gonna be people who converted to jihad in jail and will be back on the streets doing a lot of malevolent things. I won't go into this in detail, but uh, Sharia compliant finance is a way of raising funds for jihad, zakat. Uh, it's a $3.5 trillion industry these days. That's a lot of zakat, folks. Uh, next slide. Um, this is, of course, one that we've talked about several times in the course of the day. I happen to think in many ways it is the most important because in Europe and here and elsewhere in the West, the Muslim Brotherhood has been pursuing for some 50 years under our noses the destruction of our society from within. Out back, we have copies of this and you can order them if you'd like. They're also downloadable for free at securefreedom.org. This is the secret plan of the Muslim Brotherhood for destroying Western civilization from within. Don't take my word for it. The federal government introduced it into evidence in the largest terrorism financing trial in US history. And the Holy Land conspirators were convicted in no small measure on the basis of this. The beauty of it is, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't write it, Steve Coughlin didn't write it, Andrew Boston didn't write it, none of us wrote it, the Muslim Brotherhood wrote it. It's like, you know, getting the game plan for the enemy uh, handed into your locker room. We need to take advantage of it, but of course we have it. And this is the money quote from it that tells you exactly what the mission of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood in America is to quote, destroy Western civilization from within by the infidel's hands and the hands of the believers so that God's religion is made victorious over all other religions, not friendly. So what does this tell you? I mean, this secret plan, what we've learned about the Muslim Brotherhood, what we know about their civilization, jihad, from their own writings, from their practice. They've been at it for 50 odd years. They've built an immense infrastructure in this country. They have successfully penetrated our government and civil society institutions, and they're getting all kinds of help, as we've talked about, from the press, from the left, and yes, including from our government. Evidence, look no further than these two famous quotes, among many others. Islam is a religion of peace, according to George W. Bush, and we are not and will never be at war with Islam, according to President Obama. So, what have they been doing, the Muslim Brotherhood, specifically in the national security space to obscure the danger they pose to us, they and their fellow jihadist friends. Well, one thing is they've promoted this meme of violent extremism. Let me just show you a couple of slides that I hope will help explicate what has brought us to the present pass. Here you have the official government meme. Violent extremists are the enemy. And they're very small in number, basically whack jobs, you know, mentally unfit. Uh, they have nothing to do with Islam because Islam is, in fact, the religion of peace. And Muslims necessarily eschew violence, right? Well, guess what? Where's the Muslim Brotherhood come down when that is the fault line? Violence. Because we are lied to all the time and told they actually don't engage in violence or eschew it, they're on the right side. So we can safely bring them into our councils. We can in fact do what the administration has been doing, Republican and Democratic, take guidance from them on the nature of the war and what we can know and say and do about it. Well, guess who they actually think are the violent extremists that we need to be most concerned about? 
Us, you got it. You conservatives, you constitutionalists, you Tea Party people, you, oh, I don't know, gun owners. Can't have that. That's violent extremism. So look over here, folks, not at the problem. Look at those conservatives and so on. So let me show you what I think is the right paradigm, which I commend to you as a way of both thinking about it yourself and helping to explain it to your friends, family, business associates, media, and so on. It turns out that there are a lot of Muslims who actually do adhere to Sharia. I don't know what the exact number is, but since it is the authoritative practice of the faith, it's probably lots, right? There are, I think it's fair to say, some who don't, as we talked about. These guys are unquestionably our enemies. It is God's will that they be our enemies. These people, to the extent they amount to anything, might be our friends. I think there are some who genuinely are and some who might be. If we stop incentivizing people by being part of this community by understanding that this fault line really is the one that operates. And guess where the Muslim Brotherhood comes down on that? They're on the wrong side. So if we have in fact allowed them to determine our national security posture towards jihad, we're toast. And we're still in that mode. Um, I'm happy to report that some of our colleagues had a very important opportunity to testify before Senator Cruz at the end of June about the practice that has been cultivated by the Muslim Brotherhood, namely willful blindness. And uh, this nitwit, uh, our Secretary of uh, the Department of Homeland Security happily tumbled along two days later and basically confirmed everything that had been said. Uh, as it's been mentioned, I think at one point, we're not out of the woods. We have folks on the Hill who think we need to embrace this countering violent extremism project and keep throwing money at it. Um, I'm hoping that next month these guys will agree to do something different, which is chart a new course. Um, and in closing, let me just show you what I think that new course must be. Specifically, we need to get this right we need to defeat this enemy, and we need to make sure that the commander in chief that we elect in November has a mandate to do just that. I'm very pleased to say that this man, 13 minutes for everybody? For me? Okay. I, math is not my long suit, so you need to do a countdown. Um, I just want to say, come back to me. Um, radical Islam, he is identified as the threat. This is in the Youngstown speech last Monday. He is identified, not in quite so many words, but he did mention Sharia. Sharia supremacism as its ideology, which we have to counter. He has talked about the need for a comprehensive counter ideological strategy. I heard distinct resonances to the one I helped in a small way my old boss Ronald Reagan used to defeat the last totalitarian ideology that tried to take us down, Soviet communism. He pledged to keep people out who don't share our values. Hey. And then last and not, not least by any means, given what we've been talking about and what we will in this panel. He talked about the networks that support radicalization. The networks that support radicalization in the United States are basically that Muslim Brotherhood infrastructure that I talked about. They're mosques, they're Islamic societies, they're Islamic cultural centers, they're front organizations, they're influence operations. If we get ourselves a commander-in-chief who understands the mortal threat they represent, which is, by the way, discussed at length in a book that we also have out there and available on order, See No Sharia, Countering Violent Extremism and the Disarming of America's First Lines of Defense. 
Well, if we get a commander in chief who's actually going to do what he talked about in Youngstown on Monday, we got a shot. Here's the point. The capstone of that speech by President Reagan, he said many of the same things repeatedly, but in 1961 he said, if we don't fight this existential war for freedom in our generation's time, we will be reduced to telling our children and our children's children what it was like to live in the United States when men were free. I dare say you are here because you don't intend to do that. Neither do we. I'm proud to be with you. Thank you very much.